this is not a glamorous business. This is not a clever business. This is not an intellectual business, only to a certain limit. It's about making money. And if you can keep your eye on that prize, you will make uh, good money and you will do well. But I think everyone mixes a little bit of self-validation or, you know, dislike of their parents or, I don't know, uh, a sense of not being attractive enough or what, whatever is bothering you, you can express that in your trading too. And that's just dumb. Hello and welcome to this episode of My Life in Four Trades. Joining me today is Harry Melandry. Harry started his career at the Bank of England before moving into investment banking, working at firms such as Credit Suisse, ING, and Brevin Howard. Harry is now an advisor at MI2 Partners and the host of The Next Big Trade. Enjoy the conversation. Hello and welcome to My Life in Four Trades. Joining me today is Harry Melandri of MI2 and the host of the podcast, The Next Big Trade, and also Macro Insiders with Raul Powell and Julian Brigden, the only man brave enough to get between those two. Hi, Harry. Welcome. Hi, Maggie. Just to be fair, I'm only figuratively getting between them. Um, and I'm yes. not actually literally. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good <laughs> Good point. Um, you're the you're the wavy dulcet tones uh, that we see, but you but you do host it. <laughs> um, that's great. So uh, we've already established that Harry has a sense of humor, but let's find out something some more. So before we jump into your four trades, Harry, um, give us a little bit about your background. You know, where did you grow up? What were you like as a kid? Oh, same as everybody else, really. Uh, born in British Guyana in the year of independence. My parents split up when I was pretty young. Uh, my mother moved to the UK to join her family, who were all immigrating to the UK as well. Uh, my father was an Israeli-Venezuelan of Polish descent, Jewish. He was a gold and diamond prospector and dealing the Orinoco area of Venezuela. And he just figured one day he's going to fly his light airplane to Guyana and see what he found. And uh, what he found was my mother. So uh, my mother, you know, guy, typical Guyanese person, really, half black, half Indian. Uh, she left school at 13, got her degree in her 50s. Uh, she could, I figured that woman could do anything. My, my siblings will back me up. And she convinced us we could too, although I, know she, I knew she was lying. Right in the game. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I miss her every day. Okay, so two, yeah, two, two comments. Obviously, your mother, amazing. Um, and we're going to have to hear more about her in another podcast, I think. But um, that is not everyone's. That is not everyone's growing no, up. My, no. my, my, my <laughs> bio, my early bio is a lot less interesting than that. Um, I can tell you that. Um, so that that is quite a colorful mix. I mean, um, so you were you grew up in the UK, though. Is that right? Yes, I'm, I'm as British as you could come uh, minus about a year. So yeah, I grew up in the UK. And so do you have a big family? I mean, what was that like growing up in the UK, especially with that really sort of, you know, uh, background from just about every part of the world, it sounds like. Really global, cultural mix. You know, London's a pretty mixed up place. Um, yes. Uh, so I've got uh, a brother and a sister in the UK. I've got some half brothers and sisters in Venezuela. My cousin, who actually came over with me on the same boat uh, to the UK, uh, she was, I think, nine when she came over. Uh, she has nine kids. Um, she used to be a Rastafarian. So yes, we're an odd mix. We're an odd mix. I got a shout. Actually, she's got eight kids, I should say, but I think seven of them are boys and they are big boys, They're like tall guys. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I don't know. North London, it's a funny place in it. Did you have a, a dream job when you were young? What did you think you were going to do when you grew up? Well, like my son, uh, for a long time, the first five years, at least train driver was, um, that's what I was aiming for. Uh, my son is obsessed with trains. I'm, I'm, I was going to use a crude term. I'm a little tired of the train thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, then I uh, wanted, I think, neurosurgery struck me as a kind of pompous activity I'd be interested in. Pity about the gore. Didn't, didn't fancy that so much. And then, no, I didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do. I really didn't after that. So how did you come to find yourself in finance or banking? Well, the same way everyone does. I wanted some money. Um, so I started working. I went to, much against the advice of my teachers who had a good appreciation of my talents, I applied to Cambridge, uh, sat the entrance exam, got in, um, which really would have annoyed them because I was already insufferable. Right? So, 
And then I uh, took a job with the Bank of England, who spent the entire time trying to put me in their place. They pretty much succeeded. I mean, I no longer split infinitives, um, which was big back in those days. Um, and then they made the mistake of send me, sending me to Goldman Sachs on secondment, and I had some idea of, of, you know, they had much nicer coffee. The coffee at Goldman Sachs was wonderful in those days. This was the late 80s, um, well before Nespresso. So for all those reasons, I thought, oh my God, if the coffee is like this on the, in the private sector, I've, I've got to leave. And the, the people at the Bank of England wanted to send me to banking supervision, which was Bank of England equivalent of Siberia in those days. <laughs> and uh, in, in fact, they were right. I would have been a great banking supervisor, but I just didn't fancy it. So you saw a lot more action in investment banking and packed your bags. I, I got the impression there's probably more money in it. I may have been wrong. It's not, it's not impossible <laughs> to think. Uh, Andrew Bailey was actually in my intake year at the Bank of England. So he's very tall, by the way. If you hadn't met Andrew Bailey, he's very tall. Um, Are you still in touch? No, no. I, I, I wasn't that much in touch when I was there. I was uh, friendly with some, uh, some guys, like uh, a guy called Andrew Gracie sat next to me, and he ended up one of the, uh, on the governing committee for a while. Um, he was very nice, um, whereas I wasn't. So, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to see if he remembers that. <laughs> so, uh, so the, the way you describe yourself as as too smart for your own good, very roguish, very sort of misbehaved, it would have seemed that you fit in fantastic in the world of investment banking. How was the transition? Not so much. So I, I got lucky, and my wife at the time um, just put my resume in front of a guy called Ian Wace. Um, Ian Wace is uh, very well off today and very famous. He runs a, what he's kind of half of the Marshall Wace partnership. So they're quite, quite big in the UK hedge fund world. Um, but then he used to run uh, equities trading for Warburgs. And back in those days, equities trading was something like you were unusual if you were a Tottenham Hotspur fan rather than a West Ham fan. Um, everybody was uh, an Essex boy, f- supported West Ham, liked it a bit large, drank lager, and um, didn't like the look of me. And and very sensibly too, I could understand their point of view. But um, so there was a lot of friction, and uh, the guys. Well, why did why was that? Is because you were diff- so different from them? Well, I was certainly significantly more tanned than my colleagues, and I also had. I think I had all of the degrees that anyone on the desk. And I was a pompous know-it-all. So there were really good reasons to dislike me. That and if you tell me to go and get you a bacon sandwich, I, 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 there was a risk I told you to go get it yourself. And, uh, and back in those, things were different back in those days. We used to get drunk. Well, I didn't. I'm not, not a heavy drinker. But they used to get drunk out and then come back to the, because you could miss the last train to Essex, of course. And then you'd come back to the dealing floor and clamber under the desk, sleep overnight under your desk, send out the junior, like me, uh, to go and get you some clean shirts from a shirt store and work through the day losing God knows how much money trading equities. Um, Those days are long gone. You won't find, you know, people have at least one degree, if not two, if not three. Um, But back in those days, it was people like me were very suspicious and they, they weren't hugely big fans of mine. And I remember once getting uh, punched in the mouth because I said the wrong thing to somebody. And then I was, I was yeah, I know, it's, it, things have changed a lot. And then I, I got taken into a room by my boss at the time who looked at me and said, well, I hope you're not going to make a big deal about this. <laughs> <laughs> Being physically assaulted at work? Yeah, well, you know. Well, 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 well you know, there of course not. So. It was it was a boys club. Actually, the way you're describing the trading floor sounds a lot like newsrooms used to be back in the day as well. I think you know, it will maybe be. Maybe with some cig- cigarette smoke thrown in there, um, you know, um, from stories, it, stories I've heard and a little oh, bit yeah. of, of what I saw. So you're in this kind of uh, investment banking world, a little bit the outsider. Um, now, 
this kind of brings us to your first trade, which is one of your best. And I think the year was 1994, and it was trading UK bonds. So are you at Warburg now? How, how much experience do you have in this investment banking world? So the the gentleman from the equities desk, let me, Mr. Waste, let me understand that uh, it wasn't going to work out. And he was kind enough to let me look for another gig somewhere in Warburg, which is very kind of him, actually. Um And I uh, wandered around, and the people on the bond option desk uh, seemed to be strangely enthusiastic about me joining them. So uh, I I, naturally, I joined them. And uh, I spent about six months writing marketing material for them, Um, which is extremely tedious, I've got to tell you. Uh, But oddly enough, suddenly, a large number of people on the desk left. And it's only in retrospect that I realized they knew perfectly well they were all going to quit which is why they were so keen to hire me. We've got to get at least one body here. And then when we leave, we can say, oh, don't worry, Harry's here, who knows nothing at all about how to do this. So you can't can't complain. Anyway, so a lot of people left, not just the the first batch, but a few others. And before I knew it, I ended up from booking trades and and writing marketing material, I decided to trade the guilt book, um, the guilt options book. Did you know what you were doing at this point? Yeah, it, it, it took me about a year to figure it out. You know, I, I did calculus. I did my school, high school calculus equivalents, and it wasn't that difficult to know your first and second derivatives. And options trading is mostly about first and second derivatives. So, um, you know, it was a way easier for me to figure out how to trade that than it was for me to figure out how to trade equities. So you, you know what you're doing. You feel fairly confident, even though you're new to the unit. What is the trade? Describe the trade that you that you put on. Uh, I uh, was across an interdealer broker asked me for a price in a bond, uh, bond call the eight and three quarters of 2017. And for me, it's really weird to think that bond matured five years ago. That was like the long bond of when, yeah. the day when, I, when I was trading. So I got asked to make which a- means you're, Which means you're feeling old right now. Uh, right, well, right? objectively, I am old. And <laughs> the only, only thing I can say is well done for making it because, you know, not everyone does. But- um, True. But yeah, I got asked for a price in, in this longer bond, and I made the. You, you, naturally, when you get asked to make a price, like you make a wide price because uh, you know it could be anyone asking you. So I got asked how good that price was, you know, what size that price was good, and I told them it was good up to two hundred and fifty because it was a wide price, and I got taken in two hundred and fifty million, which absolutely terrified me. Um, but because it's large, it was, it's a large, it was large now you the- yeah, that book didn't have the risk to do a lot more, the risk limits to do a lot more. So I'm already hanging out Mac at my max risk levels and uncomfortably close to an, to an unpleasant conversation with a senior manager. So I wanted to hedge it up as quickly as possible. And I thought, well, I sell these at a great level. Let's see if I can hedge it up against a 10 year of the day. So, which I think was the six and three quarters of, oh, I don't know, two thousand of two thousand and whatever, it's a quarter, 90 something, I think, actually, yeah. So, um, and I hung that bid out there and I got hit, um, which shocked me to start with because I thought that bid, was, my bid was a little low. I was going to creep it up and see what there was out there. But I got hit and then it was upsized until the point that it was an absolutely perfect hedge for the other trade I did. And I thought, well, that's lucky. <laughs> when does that when does that happen? Then I asked who the name was, and the counterparty turned out to be Lehman Brothers, which meant I'd done both legs with Lehman Brothers, which meant one of us had done something terribly wrong, because mm-hmm. it was it, there's no way you could possibly want to do both legs. You know, it's, it's to my to my my relatively junior mind at the time, it was impossible to want to do these trades the other way around. So somebody here screwed up completely. And I figured the odds were it was me, right? Because I'm the one with one year's experience. Um, but it turned out over the next six months, this trade was a gift that kept on giving. And every day, uh, you know, the, the junior guy who was on with me marking my book would say, oh, you made money on that trade again today. Every day for six months for a really volatile market. And the reason being, I had traded one leg at the same yield vol as the other leg. So, you know, generally speaking, if you think of volatilities on the yield curve, the short end of the curve has actually got higher volatility in yield terms than the long end. Because the Fed moves the short end a lot more than it moves the long end. 
the Bank of England in this case, but you know what I mean. Um, so the, the short end might move 300 beeps over the cycle and the long end might do 60. Um, so they should have significant. And also in this case, there was a shortage of long dated bonds in the UK market. So the long end always kind of underperformed if it went, you know, if the market was going up, bonds were rallying, the long end would rally a little less. And if the market was going down, bonds, you know, bonds were selling off, the long end would do a little less in, in that direction. So uh, it turned out that I was right. And there was something very curious going on. The other guy had chosen to do the opposite trade and I couldn't really figure out why. But I think maybe it was something about repos. Odd, because it's an odd way to do it because the straddle seemed unlikely. I'm, I'm thinking about that too, because it's, I'm wondering if people weren't talking to each other at Lehman, but maybe not, um, maybe they were. You know, the guy who did the trade knew what he was doing and, and it was the same guy because- Oh, same guy, same exact guy, same, guy. Not same, same, same exact, exact Not just the same desk, same guy, the head oh. of the desk did the trade. So about six months down the line, um, I get asked if I'd like to go and interview. And I say, sure, I'd love to, absolutely. And it turned out the interview was with Lehman's, and I thought, great, I'll go along to that. I'd be interested just to find out how they do things. And in the middle of the interview, the guy says to me, okay, so what was your best trade this year? Well, this was, you know, 1994. Bond markets had been a catastrophe. Um, any option you bought made money because vol went up. Any option you sold lost you money. He said, what was your best trade? Well, the, the truth of the matter is my best trade was the one I did with Lehman's. And so I told him that. I said, actually, the best, the trade I did, the, and it made me three and a half million quid. So when I did with you, uh, he, he, he said, yeah, I made money out of that too. I said, you did? Okay, how, how did you do that? And he said, it's a, a proprietary thing, but we made money out of that too. And no, I did not get that job. <laughs> <laughs> I would have totally hired you. Keep your enemies close, right? Uh, your friends close and your enemies closer. Well, it's, it's, it turns out, don't have anyone who makes you look bad on your desk is a better oh, saying. Oh, that too. It's a yes. better saying. So no, I did not get that job. And, you know, life might have turned out differently if I had. Yeah. Or you'd be working with somebody who's insecure around people who know more than them, which I've found to be a, not a great work environment either. <sighs> you know, I take the view that our work environment is for us to, to influence positively, regardless of what it is. I like that. So do you think he was lying to you that he made money on it too? You know, uh, I would not rule out the possibility that he did, but I do think he was lying. If he had said to me, he, if this trade had been only in puts or only in calls, then it's possible the trade was actually a play on the repo of the bond. And this is like really abstruse stuff now that, you know, you'd have to kind of be interested in bond arbitrage to care about. Um, right. But yeah. It, but you but you suss out that, that there was a possibility, we did it in, but we chances did it in are that is. We did it in struggles. Yeah. So, so he was now, lying. Pro so probably. I mean, it's not like I know everything. I, I might think I know everything. Turns out that is not true. And I have plenty of experience proving it. So I cannot rule out the possibility that he did something that I couldn't, but I haven't been able to figure it out in 30 years. So no, I don't, I don't think he made money on that trade. I think he just... Did you ever, have you Googled where he is? You know, I haven't. I did, I used to, it was a small market back in the day. where he is. No, you know, it's a small market and for like 10 years I cared and he definitely went to a hedge fund and did well for himself. Um, and then, you know, A, I don't care and B... I, I, I'm sure he's retired somewhere and living in Aspen. And doing well. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I think that there, trade probably keeps him up at night, Harry. From <laughs> I think he was he's a hardened bond trader and it was hard to keep him up at night, believe me. <laughs> so talk to me about what you mentioned earlier that you, you learned a lesson but the wrong lesson about, about the bearish trade. What do you mean by that? So the right lesson would have been – to have put on a lot of risk in an early in a bull market and made a lot of money that way. Because it's a bull market seven eighths of the time, right? <laughs> Roughly speaking, it's a bull market year and assets go up about seven eighths of the time. It's only a bear market one eighth of the time. And frankly, if you make a lot of money in a bull market and then do it for seven years, and then you lose money in the bear market once, People will say you just got unlucky. 
They won't say, oh, you just run long all the time, heavy long, and you make a lot of money when it goes up, and really I can replicate you with a long position. They don't say, people don't think that way. So, yeah, it was definitely a mistake. Ugh, mistake is a wrong phrase, right? But uh, it was an unfortunate thing that my first big, big P&L was in a bear market. Do you, do you think that you still feel that way? Yeah, I mean, I th- you say I it's a mistake, but do you still you have that bias? Still? I have that bias. Look, um, the very like it's uh, the first blessing in in these stupid risk games is to know yourself, right? Know the mistake you're likely to make, and the mistake I'm likely to make is to be attracted to a really clever sounding bear market trade. Um, the cleverer it sounds, the more likely I am going to want to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that doesn't make it right. The, e- the best trade is easy and big. That's the, the best trade ever is always easy and big. And the worst trades are the ones that you're attracted to for, for other reasons that are non p l related. Why do you think you're attracted to the sort of difficult, messy bear trades? What, why, why don't you go for the easy and big? Uh, because we, I think we all have psychological biases, you know, like the guys I meet who are the best traders, their eye is always on the prize and they, they want nothing else but to make money. But to be psychologically that one dimensional is really difficult. Everyone's got an agenda or an ax op- operating in their subconscious. So uh, like a lot of, I remember reading uh, some stuff from a and in fact, I remember at the San Diego conference, I was sat at a table with somebody who was a trading coach, a, a, psych, a psychologist helping traders. And I think this, she's, you know, she probably helps people a lot more than anything I ever say or do, because most of the errors traders make are self-inflicted and kind of dumb. <laughs> you know? The biggest errors you make will be for the dumbest reasons. If you just sat back and very, you know, in a really kind of tedious fashion, step through your logic work out your risk reward, do the trade. This is not a glamorous business. This is not a clever business. This is not an intellectual business, only to a certain limit. It's about making money. And if you can keep your eye on that prize, you will make uh, good money and you will do well. But I think everyone mixes a little bit of self-validation or, you know, dislike of their parents or, I don't know, uh, a sense of not being attractive enough or whatever is bothering you, you can express that in your trading too. And that's just dumb. So it's so interesting. We were talking about a lot about this trade, but it was one of your best. <laughs> we're going to talk about one that's one of your worst, and that's trading emerging market debt in 1996. So I think you've moved by this point. I think that's the right time frame. You're at ING now. And so what, uh, was, yeah, the, uh, what was that yeah. work environment like? ING was wonderful. Um, in all sorts of ways. And I hat tip to any of my ex-colleagues there, even Gabby, who told me my cigarettes were like a woman's cigarettes. Uh, (laughs) You smoke a woman's cigarettes. Um, uh, These days I don't even smoke, but back then I'm smoking Dunhill. What are you talking about? It's a woman's cigarette. Oh, God. Okay, fine. Um, He's Argentinian. He's just just more macho than me. That's just how it is. So, um, So, yeah, so it was all great fun. <clears throat> we were kind of, I guess, we, Mr. Garrity, who ran the show for ING. I mean, you probably, no one's ever heard of us, but in emerging market debt and emerging market debt options, we were enormous. We, we were the only real competitor to us was uh, JP Morgan. They had better client flow. We had better, better risk limits. Um, we would do trades that nobody else would do because we were really stupid. Uh, no, really, we had enormous, we, because we had a huge appetite for risk. It's, it's the, the truth of the matter. And um, uh, there's one particular trade. So I, I was but there for a while. But you did well with that. You were talking about one, one of your worst trades, but you, that, but in general, ING, ING did well did, with that. ING did really well. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, they did well. If the market went up, ING made a lot of money because we, we tended to be long of a lot of paper. But, I was, you know, it was on the option desk and, you know, options in that. Options on distressed emerging market desk, you can make and lose a lot of money, strangely enough. <laughs> This may surprise you, but yeah, shocking. It's, it's possible. Uh, so I did that for, but I, uh, you know, there were various things nagging at me, and there are various reasons I wanted to get. It's, I, this was in New York, um, 
And then we had uh, Soros. Uh, so just before the Russian elections in, I think, 1996, um, Boris Yeltsin won another election. And that, for some reason, because in retrospect, it's like I can't conceive of how Boris Yeltsin could have lost that election. But, uh, in, but at the time, there was speculation that it, it wasn't stitched up and it was potentially dangerous. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that Russian distress debt, the Vnesh Ekonom debt, believe it or not, because it hadn't been fully restructured yet. I was trading deeply distressed and was trading very cheap and I got a, you know, and vols were creeping up as ahead of the election. I was already dragged a little bit short vol, so this was going to be unpleasant. And then Soros gives us a call and says, we're looking for 100 million uh, straddles on one month straddles over the election. And of course, my answer to that was tell her to go and, sorry, some, I, let me think of a synonym for, tell her to visit a park and walk around and see. But, but uh, it was pointed out to me that Soros would be an excellent client to have and we shouldn't tell them to do what I was going, suggested we tell them to do. And I said, no, no, Soros is not an excellent client. A cl an excellent client doesn't call you up a week before the, the Russian elections asking you to make an offer in $100 million of an option for which there is no offer. And then I was told, you have to make a, a price, so make make a two-way price. So I said, sure, I'll make you a price, and I'll make you one. In, in volatility terms, I made them 120 130% volatility. I can't remember what the premium was. Um, and then we, there was a screaming match, absolute screaming match, as the, the hedge fund manager concerned, who, by the way, was one of the first lady hedge fund managers. Um, the hedge fund manager concerned absolutely laid and saying, you read me, <laughs> you read me. And of course, my answer to this is, you know, it ain't difficult to figure out you're not a seller of vol over the Russian elections because nobody else is. And secondly, I would like to buy them because I'm already slightly short. What do you want me to do? So she then, this whole thing was litigated with the head of sales and then the head of trading. And they came back and they said, you're going to sell these options to this to Soros at this price. And I said, you know we're going to lose a lot of money doing this. And they said, no, you can just cover it. I said, there's no way to cover it. No, there's no seller of this stuff. It's impossible. <laughs> he said, you're still going to sell them at this price. I said, well, I think we're going to lose three or four million dollars. And they said, no, you'll, you'll be fine. Go ahead, do it. So we did it. Um, I quit about a month late. I think, no, it was, I quit before... Before even the elections happened, I was pretty sure I'd get another job, and I'd always wanted to see America, so <laughs> I quit. <laughs> and I rented a Ford Mustang convertible and drove across the U.S. Um, and it was a nice. I recommend the trip to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> not... Wait, was it over? Was it was it over that being forced to take that trade against what you thought was right, or was it just that that coincided with you just being kind of ready to make a change? So, uh, 70, 30, um, I was probably going to leave anyway, which is a mistake, by the way. I should have stayed. It would have been better to stay. Um, but a lot of it was recognizing that um, I had no power. And if you have no power, effectively what they just did was, was dip their hands. The marketing budget dipped their hands into the trading P&L and said, can I have a couple of million dollars, if not three or four? And... Uh, and they completely, you know, and if they can do that once, they can do that again. And, and that matters because people's bonuses and stuff are based off your it's performance. So. It's a transfer of bonus, effectively. Yeah, that's what happened. And the, I can see that, like, any manager would say, look, if the client is valuable. Then, but this was a, it was silly to think that if you just hand Soros $3 million that you've gained a client. You haven't. You really haven't. Well, what you've done is given someone $3 million. So if you wanted a client, you'd have to build a relationship in a more organic fashion. If you give them $3 million, they'll come back and ask you for another $3 million, but you don't necessarily have a client. So anyway, that was my take on it. And, you know, I was a spoiled brat. Um, uh, so I thought, great time to do it. And I wanted to quit anyway. And I went off and drove across America and made a few phone calls and got another gig back in the UK. So what, what do you think you learned from that trade? What was your takeaway from that trade? If you are a spoiled brat, you will uh, ruin your career. 
right? It's a bad thing to do. Everyone should be a team player. See it from the wider point of view and take your time and strategize. Do not just walk out in a huff. It's a mistake, almost always. Did you know that as you were contemplating driving across in your Mustang that that was the case? Like, did you think, oh, I sh- I kind of lost my temper with that? No, or no. I were you did, convinced I, I, you'd made the right decision? I wasn't convinced I'd made the wrong decision. Um, in retrospect, I think it's I, I have a take a, a totally different take on the thing. But uh, you know, at the time, I was indignant. You know, I thought this is people are behaving really badly, and this is going to uh, you know hurt my career and blah blah blah. It was silly, a silly take. I was spoiled, and I was being a brat, and it was a dumb way to look at the thing. And it's true, I was probably going to look to move anyway, um, eventually. But you know, I just. What can I say? I, I, it was an error and it was an emotional decision, not a, not a smart decision. When did, when did you uh, cure yourself of that? You have perspective about it now. What, what, where was the change where you said, had a talk with yourself and said, you know what, this isn't? You know, I, I think um, I could not tell you exactly when that transition, but it's a difference between being a young man and being an old man, I think. Um, there comes a point where pretty much... Every- I would say wise man, Harry, not... Well, man, you, know, man. So you, you get some things along with the bad knees, right? So there's yeah. some positives as well as the negatives. And um, I, although the jowls, I never get used to the jowls. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, at the time, I was convinced of my own bulletproofness. And I think that has disappeared... And I, besides, the thing is, I didn't know what I was doing. And I think that's the biggest problem everybody who comes into uh, any professional field without a back, you know, without family who have some idea of that or corporate life or, or I think that, I think, you know, mentorship is about that. And in fact, when we talk about another trade, uh, one that was actually successful, um, when we talk about that, and by the way, I, I got the anecdotes about how disastrously this trade went afterwards. It was, it was, it surpassed my expectations about how badly any trade could go. Um, and you I mean, kn- from I the knew, colleagues that stayed. Yeah, yeah, and I knew it was going to be a bad one, but um, yeah, you'd be surprised how much defaulted Russian debt can rally on a Yeltsin win. Um, who'd, who'd have thunk it? So, Harry, your third trade is one of your best, and that's staying with the theme of Russia, buying Russian bonds during the great financial crisis in 2008. Ah, uh, yes. So there's, so I'm really glad I can talk about this because it invo- there's a whole bunch of stuff mixed in with this trade. So first of all, a lot of the financial security we have, and boy, I love financial security. I don't make you. But I really like financial security. I'm a big fan of it. Um, so a lot of the financial security we had came from this trade. And like at the time, I just, the team I worked for had just quit Aberdeen Asset Management. We were about to be site, uh, hired by Brevin Howard. Um, we were on gardening leave. Um, so you're a group that's moving from yeah, one Yeah, we were another. the absolute return straight. We're a bond team, the rates team of what was at one point Deutsche Asset Management and then subsequently became Aberdeen Asset Management. Um, And then we as a team were invited to join or offered the opportunity to join Brevin Howard. So, um, and it was a wonderful thing because we were not involved in the catastrophe that was the global financial crisis. So you're on garden leave and you're watching Russia in all this. Why is your eye on Russia? So... You know, once once you've spent time in Russia, your your eye is always on Russia. And you always have an opinion. I'm always losing money on that stuff. Um, so that's one thing. And secondly, I I was uh, a very so my uh, father had died uh, in the I want to say mid like 1996 rings a bell like maybe 1998 1996 I think. Um, and one of the and he had kind of introduced me to more of the relatives on his side of the family. And I got very close to my cousin. My cousin was a very successful guy. I'm not going to give his name. 
I was in touch with him and we, we chatted, I guess, swapping stories about what was going on. But this, this, this one attracted both of us. He had just bought himself a villa. There's an Italian bank called Medio Banca. Um, Medio Banca is like the, I don't know, Casanova. It's like a, the establishment private bank, merchant bank for the Italian elites. And if a merger goes through in Italy, it doesn't matter if Goldman Sachs is co-advising, one of the advisors will be Medio Banca because they know everybody. Everybody you need to know, you, you've got to deal with Medio Banker. Medio Banker, one of the partners and family members, senior, was uh, divorcing his wife. The wife had got on a house um, on the coast of uh, Ventimiglia, which is right against Monaco. These, these ha- this house was in the middle of a compound, like an area like where they'd always been very rich. It's like 16th century kind of castellas, like kind of castle houses. These things are beautiful right on the coast. You can moor your yacht opposite it. And all the Medio Banker guys had these houses. It's like 15 minutes drive to Monaco, into downtown Monaco. And my cousin bought one of them. <laughs> he bought one from the wife. So if you have one family and my cousin, my Jewish cousin, in the middle of them. <laughs> Hi, every guy. How are you doing, guys? <laughs> so yeah, he was not popular <laughs> with those guys. But he had decided he was going to get the Ukrainians to pay the cost of this thing. So uh, he figured there was a huge opportunity at the time because we had all the debt for the kind of corporates in Ukraine. When, when, when Lehman's went bust, everything got fire sold. And I saw this uh, before uh, when I worked in Russia. I saw what happens when Lehman's, Lehman's got an order from, you know, had a repo book with a client, and I think they must have decided to to sell down the repo book. And, you know, when you sell down a repo book, you do it. In, this is kind of the MO. You sell it badly. <laughs> you don't you don't sell it carefully. Oh, no, we're not going to minimize your loss. We are going to absolutely destroy this market with half of the paper or maybe th- two-thirds of the paper we've got we're selling. And it's sell it really badly. Yours, 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 yours. And then we're going to transfer the rest of this paper onto our own book at that price, whatever that last price is. So... You know, you could argue that what happened to Lehman's in 2008 was kind of karmic. They were destroyed by much the same kind of financial naughtiness that they used to dish out to other people. Um, But it had left these corporate bonds trading at really low prices. Now, me, being an idiot, I decided I wanted to buy quality corps. So I bought these Russian (laughs) <laughs> you're laughing at the quality Russian names. Yes. But I bought like the the company that makes MIG airplanes. I, I took advice from a very good friend of mine uh, who's a fantastic uh, lady trader, no names of anybody, but she was uh, absolutely no. She's a great credit analyst. And she just gave me some advice on what names to buy. I didn't know which names were good and bad. I took her advice. So I ended up buying $400,000 blocks of the company that does MIG airplanes at 40 cents in the dollar. Like I, I paid 40 cents, I think, for the company that makes the pipelines for Transneft. I bought that and I, and I ended up spending like, a, I think, one and a half, maybe one and a quarter million dollars of cash buying these Russian bonds at about an average price of 40 cents in the dollar. Gazprom was one, but Gazprom was more like 60 cents in the dollar because that really is quality, you know? So, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> Recognized at hey, the time. There you right? go. There you go. Um, and all of these bonds, I just held them. And I'd seen this game before. So what had happened was an absolute gift to me. I had absolutely seen exactly the same thing in 1998 when I was working in Russia then. I this before I absolutely seen this. I've seen paper destroyed. I'd bought some paper for myself. All the paper went to I paid 11 cents in the dollar for Ian or 14 cents in the dollar for Ian's. I let them go at the equivalent of 40 or 50 cents and plus the coupons. Um I bought Sibnef bonds. They worked really well as well. And so I, I kind of knew how this story ended. And I think this is like the big secret source for people. If you if you know how the story is going to end, if you feel absolutely sure you know how it's going to end, it's much easier to have a meaningful position. So I bought this stuff and I, I bought enough to make, I guess, about a million, million dollars, a million and a half dollars of profit on it. It's uh, been useful to us. It's kind of like making that money then, investing it okay since has kind of ensured a certain measure of financial security for me and the family. Um, but uh, my cousin, he bought 
well over $30 million worth of Ukrainian bonds at 13 cents on the dollar, but collateralized by various shopping malls. He liked shopping malls, my cousin, did a lot of property. And he made $30 million, $40 million out of this trade as well. And he used that money to retire the debt from buying this villa on the coast. And the moral of this story is, do it big. <laughs> if, you know, if you know what's going to happen, don't mess around. Don't, do, it, do it properly. All right, we have to get to your fourth and final trade. And this is an arbitrage of Mexican swap rates, I, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't even, is this, a, is this a good one or a bad one? You know, uh, both, I guess. I guess this is both. So um, sometimes trades make you money. Sometimes trades teach you lessons. Um, I found it because I'm a bit slow that uh, I need to be taught the same lesson multiple times. Um, you are not alone, Harry. Right. So this one was kind of interesting because really it was a culmination of learning across multiple years in multiple environments. And, you know, you do in G7 rates at the time, it's very common to do these kind of forward starting swap trades, right? Up in, up in the curve. Um, I was trying to bring the same notion to Mexico, uh, to the Mexican swap curve, which had all sorts of like weirdnesses going on. And some of that was because um, there were this market was populated by very big pension funds and the very big pension funds and, and some, let's just say, West Coast um, asset managers um, – would mess around in it. The left coast asset managers maybe didn't mess around quite as unscientifically, but the, this was considered to be a market where Mexican pension funds dominated. Of course, they were. They're called the Fores, by the way. Um, and some guy had decided to use the seven-year point of the curve as his personal piggy bank. Um, if he he had a big paid position, which means he's kind of short bonds on the seven-year point of the curve. And if he needed to show some p &L because other trades were going wrong, and I, by the way, I don't know this for gospel. This is kind of what I was told by people who were close to people. So I'm putting a, together a story. It may not be the gospel truth because, you know, we don't know what other people are thinking at any moment in time. Um, but he, every, you know, you'd be sitting there watching this thing and the seven-year point would be trying to trade towards where it should be. And then towards the end of the day, like five minutes ago, someone out of nowhere would, would suddenly... Uh, pay it to the tune of 100,000 basis points, $100,000 a basis point, and the thing would widen against the curve by four or five beeps. And you're like, what the hell happened? How come I've suddenly lost money? So um, the trade I was doing, the, the, I did it in various forms, but the kind of obvious way of putting it was a five-year, two-year forward versus a seven-year, three-year forward. And this was ended as very much like doing a five, sevens, tens butterfly, where you're receiving the seven-year point. Um, but just weighted slightly differently. Now, I've, at this point, everyone listening to this podcast is saying, this man is so boring. This man is so boring. <laughs> and and you, are, you are right. You are right. But they, they ask the question, and I don't talk about this stuff at home with the wife or the kids because nobody's interested. But it was interesting to me, right? So, yeah. so I put this trade, and I was going to build the biggest position the earth has ever known in this thing because this thing was a carry monster. Like, unless the yield curve inverted for some weird reason, like, I don't know, there's a pandemic or something, um, unless there was some weird stuff going on in the Mexican curve, this was just going to roll down. And as it rolled down, uh, the carry was so enormous on the thing, it was rolling enough to make a kind of sizable amount. And I, I did an estimate of the sharp ratio on the trade, and it's saying it was fantastic. It was over like 2.3 or something on a sharp. The trade, the, the trade itself had a sharp above. So... So you just felt hugely confident. I, everything else I'd ever learned in markets where you do this kind of trade told me that this was a beautiful winner, a beautiful, beautiful thing that it could only exist because some guy was dumb enough to try and manipulate a yield curve. Because right? otherwise, it, it just didn't make any sense for this. It's, if we're talking about finding $1,000 in the street. So what, so what went wrong or what went right? <laughs> well, you know, some things went right, first of all. So first of all, I met, I interviewed, I was looking for a junior trader and I met a young lady, a fantastically good looking young lady. And this was the problem with her. Um, so I met a young lady who was very bright 
and uh, it's you know you'd be surprised how hard it is to find bright market makers in rates. So she was a very bright young lady and a very good mathematician, perfect for this, very good at arithmetic, and she had a she had been trained by Deutsche who were much better market makers than me to make markets in an effective way. I was a terrible market maker and I hired her. We now had a good market maker while I wrote spreadsheets, which did rel- relval and told her what trades to put on where the arbitrage boundaries were. We started making money hand over fist. It was really because she, the spreadsheets I built her told her exactly which points were cheap or rich. And she knew how to extract that money optimally efficiently from the rest of the market. So we were whacking the ball out of the park. Um, uh, in this and as I said the big negative was she was good looking she got a proposal to marry and quit and married this uh, multi-millionaire family uh, it's a disaster right but it's hard to compete with that it's, I, I said to her are you sure you want to you know, leave this business and become a, a billionaire's wife I mean are you sure <laughs> Yes, I love him. No, I was joking. <laughs> Run. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, also, you know, I went off to see some asset management firms and I said to them, look, I found $1,000 lying on the floor. Would you like some? And they said, you, that never happened. Show me. So then I run them through the case and the, the, the guys who understood it went, yeah, that's you're right. It, maybe it doesn't. It, it's possible that it doesn't work, but it will be a kind of weird world if it doesn't work. So I had a decent number of orders and we were sh- moving this stuff in. Every day, the Mexican pension fund kept on trying to stop it, kept on pushing the market a seven-year point cheap on the curve. Every day, I'd be buying it up on behalf of these clients and I already had a position. But unfortunately, uh, they had... So what went wrong? Um, UBS, uh, my boss at the time hired someone to be my boss. And this is not an unreasonable thing, but the new guy coming in, who, by the way, had a problem wiping his nose. I mean, he, he yeah. really, if you go out on a night, remember to wipe your nose thoroughly before you come back to the office. I don't want to see you messing around with the edges of your nose and having winter allergies or whatever they call it. Anywho, so... So he came, he came in and he wanted very reasonably to have his own people, right? He wanted to people he could trust and rely on. And he was absolutely, he read me perfectly. Relying on me was a dumb move. I am not, I do not have your back. I'm never going to have your back. You're absolutely right. We should have, what we should have done was gotten together and we should have negotiated my exit anywhere else. But instead it turned into a pissing match and a fight and it's it stupid. It was just stupid. So, um, I found that I got a call from risk management and these positions had been on hadn't moved forever and they called me up saying, what are these positions? I, why are you calling me? These positions have been here for six months. Why do you give a shit now? I said, I, you know, someone just expressed concern. Anyone I know? I can't tell you who expressed concern. So I thought about it and I, all the stuff I knew about life and basically if anything went wrong with these trades, I'd be immediately fired. And I thought, you know what? I know this is going to make absurd amounts of money. I know it's going to, it's going to make budget, but the best thing to do is to get rid of it. So I, I felt very sad about it. I, I closed out on that position. It took forever because, you know, it's a, it's a messy old thing to do five year, <laughs> five year, two year, <laughs> seven year, three year. It's multiple legs of trades and to unwind it is also a messy thing to do. And you give away a bunch of money when you do that. Um, but we unwound the trade. Um, we'd, we'd made a bunch of money in the process, but we could have made three to four times as much money. Um, and I think for me, I wanted to flag this one up. There are other trades I could flag up as well. But I think it, it just goes to show you all the things that come together. They need to come together in the right place at the right time in an organization for people to hit the ball out of the park. It turns out, even when everything lines up perfectly, it's maybe it isn't enough. You need, a, you know, a few other things need to line up too. And uh, it just, it just is what it is. So I got fired out of UBS uh, and I don't really know why, but my boss also got fired out of UBS about three weeks later. Um, <laughs> quite possibly because... Maybe for give, making you close out a trade that was basically found money every day. You know, it's possible that people may have gone back and looked through my email. It's possible as if somebody had gone from a, a, a part of UBS that bothered to look through emails, had gone through those emails, 
what they would have seen would have made them very unhappy about you know with certain things so that's that maybe it doesn't really matter though i mean like if i was younger and stupider i'd have blamed ubs but in this situation i think it was just is my error and my boss's error and we should have negotiated a better solution to this problem but it's just neither of us you know i didn't feel in a place where i could be frank with him and i don't think he saw the need to be frank with me i think that's i think that's so interesting and it's a theme that's come up in you know th- in several of the different places you've worked and it it sort of worries me as someone listening to this that that's the case is there a is there do you think still a cultural problem in investment banking no it is it's all very to some degree i mean look um this particular guy he was a keen sportsman in a non in a less popular sport right and it was a a key networking device it was a network con context i can't even give you the sport because it will narrow down who it was to 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 great a degree um uh but yeah it's i don't know if this is cultural this is about individual you know, I think most of it is about individuals optimizing their personal objective function, not their bank's objective function. And I think it was a perfectly sensible thing for that particular boss to do, to want to have uh, his guy in that chair. It would make him a lot safer in the event something went wrong. So yeah, but I- is, that, is that the point? That's not the point, though, Harry. The point is not job security. This is what we complain about uh, political leadership. The point is not job security. <laughs> like, that's not why I... His, you know, his objective his point was, was right. his job security. Yes, I know. And it was very hard I, to design a structure or a thing to to break his personal incentives. He was always going to prioritize his personal incentives over the bank's incentives. My, you know, and I was going to prioritize my incentives over his. That's why there were certain things linger, you know. So it, I, I think the, the thing I would emphasize to kids or something looking at this is how important it is to understand your environment. And you're never going to understand it. Kids are naive. They're not going to get the joke about what matters and what doesn't. Let me give you an example. I remember like someone asked me, you know, a question in email in, a, in UBS. And the question was kind of, when did you stop beating your wife? You know, you know, that kind of question, like there's meant to be no good answer to this. Because to a great degree, what you, the, the question was such that if I didn't want to go anywhere near answering it, and I was angry they'd sent me the email. Right, because if I answered it in any way, it would make it look as if I was involved with something I didn't want to have any involvement with, and I, I definitely wanted to make sure that I had nothing to do with X, Y, Z, and it might that kind of situation can arise because you want to be, don't want to be seen to be involved in other people's poor behaviours, or you don't want to be seen to be involved with a trade that you think is problematic and can go terribly wrong. Um, Frankly, if I sent emails like that to my boss, I would not be surprised he was angry with me because my boss is now in the position that he is the guy in line for trouble should he answer that email, right? So, and then you've got the, why didn't you answer the email if you, if you didn't answer it? So you need a team to to look out for each other. And uh, that's not always how investment banks or even hedge funds work. I would say even broader than that, office politics is real. I think that when you're young, you think that if you do your job well, that's what's important. And then later on, that's not unimportant, but you can't do that without understanding the way politics works. You don't always have to participate in it, but you have to understand it. That's absolutely right, Maggie. Absolutely. And I think that's what the whole thing about mentoring is about reminding people that they they don't operate in a vacuum. It isn't that there's an algorithm marking you and grading you. There are people looking at you and talking about whether they like working with you, whether you're a team player, whether you work for them. And, you know, it turns out that your boss's objective functions are more important even than the organization's objective functions. And, like, why would that not be the case? It's up to the organization to set incentives the way that suits your organization. So your boss 
his incentives ought to be set. If the organization has done a bad job aligning incentives, that's not your boss's fault. That's people above your boss who've screwed up, right? Um, and and that, that can happen. I just think, I think the takeaway, and it's always a takeaway that's more interesting, right? Um, the takeaway here is that you need to work out how you can solve your colleagues' problems and in particular your boss's problem. And if you are not solving your boss's problem, why, why, why don't you? Why do you think that something bad isn't going to happen to you? There are going to be a lot of people that doesn't sit well with because it sounds like kissing up to the boss. I think in com- commercial activity is always about solving somebody's problem. Everything's about that. Um, kissing up to the boss. If it was just kissing up, it would be pointless. But you know what? Kissing up to the boss exists because it works. Um, what I'm saying is solve your boss's problem and hopefully um, there's an alignment of interest between you and him that makes it worthwhile, you know, him advancing you and you're working for him. Um, that isn't always going to be the case. Unfortunately, like there's nothing you can do to ensure that your boss is not an imbecile. It's usually not in your gift. <laughs> That's right. It, that's a really good way. That's a really good way of putting it, though, because it is it, it the idea of understanding what problem you're solving. Because it's not just about being right in theory. It's about understanding, and sometimes there are multiple. The problem you think you're solving, it, and then understanding your boss's problem and whether you're solving that and how to deal with that. I think that's sophisticated advice, but it's really good advice for people who are just starting out in the working world or at banks or wherever. You you, you put it very well. You, and I, I spent a long time fascinated in, you know, trading is essentially alchemy, if you ask me. Alchemy is this process of, of creating value out of base metal, right? Trading, you're converting information and logic into money if you do it right. Uh, it's not a reliable process. It's not something you guarantee that any individual transaction or trade works. But over time, if you have a, some measure of whatever you define as skill, uh, you will slowly a- accumulate trading profits. Um, that's great. And now, what is the objective of the organization? What is the objective of your boss? And generally speaking, it isn't necessarily maximizing that PL. There may be other problems that are bigger, you know, more important, more pressing, or whatever. And you you need to be able to internalize that objective as well and make sure that you're in line with that function. So I, I mentioned that. Um, I'm still fascinated with the alchemical problem of of creating money or anticipating the future in such a way that you can profit from it. I believe that's something that never you know it's not even a question of fashion we are all in, engaged in that endeavor whether we know it or not right when you buy your house in out in a suburb of ohio it matters whether or not they're going to de-industrialize that place and that everyone's going to lose their job and then you're tied into a piece of real estate that does not perform um everyone is involved in predicting the future to some degree Harry, this has just been such a joy and so much fun hearing the stories. And as always, I appreciate and love your sense of humor. So thank you so much. My pleasure. I didn't even tell you the story of when I was stripped naked by Russian customs. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to leave dot, dot, dot until next time. You might be our, you, you might be our first ret- return trip on My Life in Four Trades, Harry. You heard it here first. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, Maggie. Till the next time. All right, that's a wrap on this week's edition of My Life in Four Trades. For more on the series, visit realvision.com forward slash my life in four trades. Make sure to use the numeral four. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you like this show, you're going to love Real Vision Essential. At Real Vision, we talk to the most successful investors in the world and deliver videos that make finance interesting. It's all about helping you become a better, more confident investor. Now, we could dress that up in fancy marketing buzzwords, but it's really that simple. Oh, and right now, you can join Essential for $99 for a full year instead of the usual $239. Visit realvision.com forward slash Essential99 to join the Real Vision community. That's realvision.com forward slash Essential99.